Okay, so I, uh, I really want uh, to talk about two subjects uh, at once, sort of, but that are strongly uh, related. So the, the first one is about topology. So uh, in topology, you can study uh, various uh, kinds of spaces. So a subfield of topology is manifold topology. Where you study manifold, that could be topological manifold or smooth manifold, for instance. And then uh, when you study manifold topology, there is something which you uh, notice uh, uh, rather quickly, is that the, di the dimension of the manifold is very important. Uh, the, the kind of problems that you want to tackle and the tools that you have uh, to deal with them uh, strongly depends on the dimension. And so I'd be concerned with dimension three, which is rather special. And uh, so this is a standard subject on one subject which is slightly less uh, well known, although there is an extensive literature on it, is open three manifold topology. That is, uh, you look at three manifolds uh, which are non compact. And so, in this context, open really means non-compact and without boundary. But of course, I will also tell you about compact three manifolds, because it, it will be inter inter important to first uh, learn about compact three manifolds, uh, then try to understand what happens when you don't have the manifolds are not compact. So that's one. Uh, one subject. And then there is uh, something uh, different, which is called global Riemannian geometry. And uh, so uh, this is a, a, a field where, where you try to understand, so you're working with Riemannian manifolds. And you try to understand the relationship between uh, various uh, notions, some geometric notions, uh, for instance, curvature, or various, uh, various notions of curvature, uh, possibly volume, diameter, and, and, so, uh, and so forth. And uh, you also uh, want to understand the co connection with topology. And of course, this is a very uh, large subject. Uh, this uh, will also um, be the topic of uh, Thomas, uh, the talk by uh, the, um, the mini course by Thomas Richard, uh, which will be one aspect of this. So there will be some some points of uh, contact between the two, and of course the course on minimal surface theory by Laurent Mazet. And uh, here I will uh, emphasize the topological aspects. So I will restrict attention to the case when the manifold is, is uh, low-dimensional, two-dimensional two or three-dimensional, and uh, uh, in particular when the manifold is non-compact. So that's the, the plan. Now for uh, today, I would like to start with uh, two manifolds because it's, uh, it's not useful to try to understand three manifolds if you don't already have a uh, rather uh, good uh, basic understanding of two manifolds. So that's chapter one. So before I start, I would like to make a general convention that will uh, save so allow me to uh, save some time. So. Whenever I, I say a, a manifold, unless uh, explicitly stated or otherwise, I will only consider orientable manifolds. This is just for uh, simplicity of exposition. What I, what I will say will be in general true also for non-orientable non manifolds, but sometimes more difficult to prove uh, technically. Also, uh, everything will take place in the smooth category. Uh, and when I say manifold, I usually I mean connected manifold. I will probably uh, forget to say it most of the time. And also, by default, uh, manifolds don't have a boundary. 
But uh, you will see that uh, in some cases it's useful to work with uh, manifolds with boundary, but this will be, uh, I will explain this uh, later. Okay, so, uh, so let's start about uh, topology and geometry of surfaces. So before going to the non-compact case, uh, let's, uh, let's talk about the compact ones. So if you put all those uh, restrictions, then there are uh, very few uh, surfaces. So I'm going to draw a, a table where I will um, uh, put, uh, put many folds into uh, three columns, uh, small many folds, uh, well, rather small, but I would call them medium-sized manifolds, and uh, big ones. So that, this is not supposed to mean uh, anything uh, mathematical for the moment, but then uh, let me uh, explain what I mean. So first, wh what are the surfaces? So the sm small one, that is just the two sphere. Uh, medium-sized, uh, there is just the torus. That's because I'm only considering the orientable one. If I were considering non-orientable one, there would be also the protective plane here and the Klein bottle there. And the, and the big one is just the ones, the, for instance, this one, that are more complicated. And so if you want to, to classify them, topologically, you have uh, several possibilities. Uh, the first one that I think it goes back to Riemann, is the genus. So the genus is zero in, in case of the sphere. It's one in case of the torus, and it's uh, two or more for other surfaces. Then, uh, instead of uh, considering the genus, you could also consider the Euler characteristic for surfaces, for those surfaces it will uh, amount to the same. So the other characteristic of the two sphere is two. Uh, for the torus, it's uh, zero. And uh, in general, it is uh, two minus two G, where G is the genus. And, uh, and therefore, for the higher genus surfaces, it would be negative. And this, this is a classification of surfaces. So uh, let me uh, say uh, briefly what I mean by that. Um, so, so when I have two surfaces, or in general two, uh, two manifolds, so say F1 and F2, I will write this to mean that either uh, that the surfaces are homeomorphic or that they are diffeomorphic. Turns out that uh, in dimension two and three, uh, those are equivalent. Although in, in dimension three, it's a, it's a difficult theorem, but it's true. So I can, so I don't have to distinguish be between the, the two. And uh, so I'm interested in classifying those uh, surfaces up to uh, homeomorphism or diffeomorphism. And uh, this is done by the genus or Euler characteristic. So. <coughs> Uh, so if I want to state a theorem, classification of surfaces, uh, this will uh, have the, the following. So every uh, compact, so connected, orientable, uh, and so on, uh, to many folds, uh, is uh, homeomorphic to uh, one of these. Genus G, and uh, if uh, two surfaces are homeomorphic, then they have the same genus. Okay. So 
So it's as, as simple as it, uh, as it gets. Now, uh, I can continue. If you uh, want to uh, look at things from a more uh, algebraic perspective, from the point of view of algebraic topology, then uh, what you are going to do is look at some uh, invariants, the first invariant being the fundamental group. And uh, the, the, these are uh, easy to compute. Uh, the fundamental group of the sphere is the trivial, trivial group. Uh, the fundamental group of the torus is uh, isomorphic to uh, Z squared. So in particular, it's, it's infinite uh, abelian. And uh, presentation for power one of surfaces can be computed. I'm not going to, to do the, the computation because I won't, I won't need it. But, uh, but they are, uh, can be called large groups. So for instance, they are non-abelian. Uh, they contain a, a non-abelian free group. So that's, that's one reason from the uh, algebraic uh, perspective to say that the sphere is the, sm is the smallest one, that the torus is a bit uh, larger and the other ones are, are bigger. But in this uh, Many course, I won't be too much interested about pi one, but more, more as I told you about uh, Riemannian geometry and curvature. And here you have, we have a very nice situation. Is that um, the sphere admits matrix of a strictly positive curvature, the torus admits matrix uh, of zero curvature, and the other surfaces admit metric. Uh, of negative curvature, and moreover, uh, this is exclusive, that is, the sphere cannot have a metric of curvature uh, zero, zero or negative, and, uh, and so on. So there is a strong connection between the sign of the curvature, assuming that the curvature has a sign, and the, uh, the topology. And uh, this connection is given by the Gauss-Bonnet formula. So the Gauss-Bonnet uh, formula reads like this. So F, uh, here F is a compact surface. And then uh, you can integrate. So K is the Gauss curvature. And if you integrate it, then you have something which is proportional to the Euler characteristic. Uh, so that's, uh, in particular, if uh, the curvature is, uh, say, well, the star is positive, then this quantity is positive, and therefore uh, the Euler characteristic of the of the surface is positive, but uh, as I told you, the only one is possible is the sphere. And likewise, uh, in the zero case and in the no negative case. So this proves that um, the, uh, the restrictions on the sign of the curvature, and in order to have the, the other uh, statements, you need to be able to construct uh, metrics with red on those surfaces where the curvature has this property. So this is something I, I assume that most of you know, know that uh, already, but if you don't, that's the, the first exercise. Uh, so construct. Um, on each compact surface, a Riemannian metric. Of uh, constant cu Gauss curvature.
Okay, so before uh, leaving compact surfaces, I would like to um, uh, give a second exercise, which is uh, an easy one, and that um, the purpose of this is to see that, uh, that the gauss, uh, the, the gauss bonnet formula is really something interesting when you want to understand the relationship between geometry and topology on surfaces. And so it's a Chiger type uh, finite nest uh, result. So, uh, so the exercise is proved that so for every uh, constant, uh, um, sorry, capital A, uh, there are only finitely many Uh, surfaces uh, uh, which admit uh, Riemannian matrix uh, such that the Gauss curvature is bounded in absolute value by something which I take to be one and uh, the area is uh, less than uh, a and this defined that less is up to of course it's not that finite it's finite up to homeomorphism or diffeomorphism in this case uh, it, it's the same Okay, so uh, that's all I wanted to say for, uh, about compact surfaces. Now, uh, for non-compact surfaces. So this is already uh, more involved. So uh, the, there is a, a general theorem which is often called the classification theorem for non-compact surfaces. Uh, before uh, stating the theorem, I need to, uh, to introduce uh, some of them. So first, let me give some examples. So uh, uh, perhaps the, f the first example that comes to mind for a non-compact surface is R2R2. Uh, well, another example would be a Cartesian product of two one manifolds. So if you want the manifold to be non-compact, you have only uh, those two possibilities. Uh, then uh, do, you can do a following construction. You can start with a closed surface. F, and then uh, you take some finite sets, which I'm not going to, to, uh, to call F, so uh, let's uh, call it S, and then to, you simply take the, the complement of F in S, so that means that you, you take, for, for instance, this surface, and you re remove finitely many points. So, Topologically, this is the same as uh, you can think that those points are, are at, at in infinity, but you can, you can also uh, think of this surface in this way. And uh, by the way, you can uh, realize that uh, this, uh, those two examples are actually special cases of, of uh, of this because uh, R2 that's the same as uh, S2 minus a point and uh, S1 cross R is the same as 
is 2 minus 2 points. So those, uh, those surfaces, I would call, call them a finite type. And uh, they can be understood in much the same way as a compact manifold. So for me, they are not interesting. I'm, I'm going to be interesting in the, the surfaces of infinite type. So if you want examples of surfaces with infinite type, then there is something you can do. For, you can take a closed surface again, for instance, the two-sphere. And then you can try to remove uh, a closed set, which is not necessarily finite. And so, for instance, uh, you, can, uh, you can embed the Cantor set into S2. And uh, you can uh, take S2 minus the Cantor set. This will be uh, an open surface. which is uh, already a bit more complicated. Uh, another classical one is called the, the Loch Ness Monster. So as far, as far as I know, this terminology is due to Dennis Sullivan. And it's uh, simply this. You take R2 and uh, you attach infinitely many handles to it. And then uh, let me give you just two more examples which are uh, increasingly more complicated. So there is one which I will call for future uh, reference, I will call it F1. And well, I chose this one. So here you have to be uh, to use your imagination. So this is supposed to continue forever. So there are some, cylinder, some cylinders that, that there is a sequence of them. And then here you have, a, again, as in the log desk monster, you have a sequence of handles. So this one I call F, F1. And here's another one, which I call F2. And uh, so it's even more complicated. So at this point, you quickly notice that uh, if, in order to describe those manifolds, uh, it would be uh, useful to have a language more efficient than just drawing uh, pictures on a blackboard with lots of ellipses uh, everywhere. So uh, in, in a few minutes, I will provide a more uh, uh, um, I don't know uh, another another way to define uh, those which is. I think more satisfying. But for the moment, I suppose that you can imagine what I, what I mean. So uh, I'm going to, to state uh, the a theorem which classifies those objects. And uh, OK, I should have drawn this on the other blackboard. But uh, no. OK. Good. So. Uh, for every open surface F, so I will um, I will define to, uh, um, several invariants. There is something which uh, will be called the genus, and this uh, will be uh, a natural number or possibly infinity. And then there will 
uh, be a pair of topological spaces, which I will call E and NP. This terminology is not, uh, not, uh, not uh, standard, but that's the notation which uh, I will uh, use. And so this, this will be what is called the space of ends of F, and this will be a subset of E, which will be called the space of non-planar ends of F. And this will be enough because I'm only considering orientable surfaces. If I wanted to consider non-orientable surfaces, I would need a third one, which would be the, 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 the space of uh, non-orientable ends, and also I would need uh, additional uh, structure. So let me uh, just consider orientable surfaces. So um, well, the genus is easy to define. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's what you think. That is, when the, when the surface is of finite type, it's just a genus of the surface uh, which, uh, which I started from. And um, in general, you can define the genus as the maximal of the genus of compact surfaces that you can embed into the, the surface. And this might be, uh, so you take the supremum of this over, over all embedding, this might be finite, it might even be uh, zero. And uh, by the way, for me, a, a planar surface would be a, a surface of genus zero. And this is equivalent uh, to saying that uh, the surface uh, contains uh, no uh, uh, non-separating uh, simple, simple closed curve. This will be uh, useful later. And uh, so next uh, thing I need to, to do is define the space of ends. So there are several ways to do, uh, to do this, and I will choose uh, one uh, which is not, not the most elegant one, but one from which we can actually do computations. So uh, here's the definition. So uh, I'm going to consider the uh, a manifold M. So actually, it put, it it won't be really important that the many it's a manifold. It, the construction works in general for locally compact uh, um, topological spaces. But here I'm interested in. Uh, in manifold, and then I will uh, fix what I call an, an exo. So an exhaustion of the, of the manifold will be uh, a sequence um, of compact submanifolds which I will call the K, uh, K sub P. And uh, so I want the following. I want them to be. Uh, I want this to be an increasing sequence. And in, in fact, uh, I'm going to require something slightly uh, more, uh, slightly stronger than this. I want that for every p, uh, uh, the kp is contained in the interior of kp plus one. And then uh, I call this an exhaustion if the union of all kp is equal to the manifold to the whole manifold. So for instance, here's an exhaustion of F1, so that's where I need color choke. Okay, I'm going to do it uh, with three, three colors. Should be, be enough. Well, okay, before I do this, just um, let me make a technical assumption. I'm going to assume that uh, for every P, KP has the property that uh, the, the complement of Kp uh, does not have 
any path components uh, which is not um, w sorry which is relatively compact so here's an example of an exhaustion so k k0 I take a compact submanifold of um, of f1 and then I take a larger compact set so so I'm going to add uh, for instance this and uh, up to this and uh, k2 might be something like that so each time you, you add something And uh, you can go, go on uh, to infinity, and then uh, you assume that you, you, you do it in such a way that uh, it covers the whole manifold. So then you can define the space of ends. Uh, so E of M. And for this, you take. Uh, for every uh, P, you look at the set of uh, connected components of the complement of P. There are finitely many. And you organize this into an inverse system, and you take the inverse limit. So formally, this is the inverse limit of the space of path components, that pi zero, of um, uh, the complement of KP. So that, that's a formal definition. Uh, I'm going to explain on F1 what, uh, what the definition means in, in practice. It's not something very difficult. The space of events is just the, 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 a set of all possible ways to go to infinity in the space. So in for F1, uh, the space of n uh, is in uh, um, correspondence with the set uh, uh, the, the natural numbers union infinity with the, the natural topology. So that's, that's uh, a topological space. It's compact. It has exactly one point, which is an accumulation point, and uh, a sequence of isolated points converging to it. Okay. So, and symbolically, I can write this now. So to this cylinder going to infinity, I will uh, associate the number zero. To this one, I associate the number one and two and there are infinitely many. And then, if you want to go to infinity by staying in the upper part and going to the right, uh, then this I label by infinity. So now what you, what you need to do is to connect the formal definition here with, uh, with this. So I'm going to do it. It, might, it may uh, take some time, but I think it's it's useful to do, to do it uh, at least for a simple example. So, so what does it mean? So it means that for every uh, p, you're going to look at the complement, and you're going to, to, uh, to give names to the component, uh, the connected components of the complement. So let's start with uh, k0. So the complement of k0, in my example, you see that k0 disconnects the manifold into two parts, this lower part and this. So the first one, so I have taken notations. So the first one, the, the first part, the cylinder, I called it uh, uh, U00. And the second one, I called it U01. Then you look at the complement of M minus k1. So uh, k1 is uh, the, the union of the blue part and the orange part. So there are three uh, complements, uh, connected components of the complement. Uh, one that corresponds to the number zero, one and 
the other one. So uh, I'm going to denote them by u1, 0, uh, u11, and u12. And uh, what I'm interested in, in inclusions. So you see that u10 is uh, contained in u00. This one is contained, uh, sorry, u00 contained only this one. And those are both contained in, the, in that one. And then I, I can go on forever. So let me write the next stage, n minus k2. Here uh, you have four connected components. From left to right, so I can uh, use this notation. And again, you have some inclusions. Okay, this one. Okay. Okay. And so, what does it mean to take the inverse limit of this diagram? Uh, so form, formally, the inverse limit is a subset of the Cartesian products of all those, uh, those spaces. And well, you, you, so you take the, the, uh, the, the Cartesian product is a space of all sequences uh, of uh, such spaces, but you, you look only at the one that respects inclusion. And so, for instance, you have a a first uh, sequence of inclusions. So that means that I remove k0, I select this uh, component of the complement, then I remove this, I, I select this, co not this complement of the uh, co component of the complement, I have no choice, and so on. And so this will correspond to zero. Um, and so if you instead you do this, it corresponds to one, and so on. And if you take the, the last one, it corresponds to infinity. Okay. So uh, if it's the first time that you see this, maybe you, you find it a bit complicated. So uh, you should uh, do the exercise of working out for yourself the other examples which I've done. So some of the examples are easy because the space of n is, is finite, and uh, in, in sometimes it's more difficult. For instance, the manifold F2 is more difficult. So, um, Okay, so that's exercise three. Right, so um, then there is proposition, which is due to, to Freudenthal, so Freud, the notion of space of ends is due to Freudenthal. Uh, and so uh, this space will always be, is be compact. And it's always totally disconnected. And in fact, there is a converse. Any compact is totally disconnected. Uh, space can be embedded into the, the two sphere. And if you take the complement of the two sphere, this will give uh, a surface which has this uh, space as a space of ends. 
Good, so that's, that's the, the space of events. Now I must uh, define the other uh, set, which is a set of non-planar ends. So this is easier. Um, so definition, so let F be an open surface. So this time this is uh, special to dimension two. So uh, the set of non-planar ends of, uh, of F, so that's a subset of uh, space of ends. So this is, space of, this is the set of ends uh, C. Okay. Such that uh, uh, C does not admit any planar neighborhood. So I, I haven't uh, given the formal definition of a neighborhood of an end, and I'm not going to do it. Uh, on, um, on an examples, it's, uh, it's easy to understand what it is. So let me uh, draw F1 again. So, uh, okay, so this is F1. So let's take the the one uh, the ends with, which I've labeled by a natural number. So for instance, zero. So a neighborhood of this n is just uh, a component of the complement of some compact sets which corresponds to this end in, the, in this construction. So if I take the compact uh, set k0, k I remove. So here I have this set which I called uh, u00 if I remember correctly. So that's that's a cylinder, so it's a, it's a cylinder, it's half infinite and half bounded. Well, not bounded if, because it's a, you know, an open set, but never mind this. And, uh, and uh, this is obviously planar. And so uh, that's th that means that uh, this end uh, does not satisfy the definition, so it's, it's not non-planar, so it's planar. So uh, you, you will see why, why you where we use the, the non-planar ends rather than the, the space of planar ends. Of course, it's amount the same. Then one, it's the same. This uh, u one zero. Uh, this is a neighborhood, uh, a planar neighborhood of one and two and so on. But uh, infinity, uh, the end infinity uh, is non-planar. And in fact, so so that, that means that. Uh, the non set of non-planar ends of S1 is just uh, this one, and this is because if you take a, a neighborhood of of infinite of this uh, n infinity, it just meant that you can take a very big compact set, and uh, you look at uh, the um, the connected component of the complement which corresponds to infinity, but this will always have some handles because. In the example, I put infinity many, many handles. And so it will, will never be planar. Okay, so that's just what it means. Good. And now at last I can uh, state the classification theorem. Um, well, sorry, maybe two more things to say for the classification theorem. So, of course, there is an exercise uh, which is uh, work out what is the set and uh, other uh, examples. It, it might be empty, it may be the whole space, it might be finite, infinite. There are several possibilities. But one thing which is good to know Again, a proposition. I don't know to whom it should be attributed. Uh, this uh, set uh, is always closed. 
a closed subset of, of E. And so it's a closed uh, subset of a compact set. So in particular, it's compact. Yeah, uh, right. So now I can state the classification theorem. So it's not a classification theorem in, in the same sense that there's a, a list of all the surfaces. It's, it has a more abstract uh, character. So usually this is called uh, so okay, classification of open. So again. It, that's the orientable case. And uh, this is usually attributed to Kerry Carto uh, Richards. And uh, it says that, uh, that what, uh, what I have just defined is a complete invariant. And so uh, let's uh, f f prime be uh, two uh, open surfaces. Then they are homeomorphic, if and only if they have the same genus. And uh, the same pair. Uh, space of n's, space of non-planar n's. So that, that means that the, 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 the topological pairs, E of f uh, and P of f, is homeomorphic to uh, the corresponding pair for f prime. So at this point, I would like to, to give a classical example of application of the theorem, uh, which gives uh, a result which is perhaps not, uh, not intuitive for everyone. So remember the, the Loch Ness Monster. I'm going to give you the invariance of the Loch Ness Monster. So it's supposed to be an exercise, but well, here I need to do the exercise for you. If you're quick, you have already done the exercise, or perhaps you're, you can do it uh, right now. So what do, what do you think? So what's the genus? What do you think? <laughs> OK, it's infinity because there are ellipses here. Now, what's the space of ends? Uh, so it's, it's a point. Because um, uh, if you take a compact subset, uh, and if you insist that in the complement there are no, not, uh, non -rel no relatively compact components, then the, the, there is just one connected component. And if you take a bigger compact subset, there's again, there's just one component. So there's only one way to go to infinity. So that's uh, a set with one element. And then what's the uh, set of non-planar ends? Uh, it's the empty set because there is only one end. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry. There is only one end. It is non-planar, so this is uh, the, the whole space in this case. For R2, it would be the empty set. Uh, right, so that's uh, one uh, surface. Now, let me give an, uh, another surface. 
So what you do is you take the following uh, graph. You take a grid. Infinite uh, grid. And you embed that in R3 in the simplest way. You embed it in R2 and then R2 in R3 in the standard way. And then what you can do is you, you pick a small number epsilon and uh, you look at the boundary of the epsilon neighborhood of this set. So this set, let me call it A. Okay. And that's the surface. So epsilon number uh, just means the, the points which are at distance at most epsilon uh, from one point here. And so the, the boundary of this is a surface which locally looks like this. Okay. And then you, it, it goes on. So that's an open surface. And uh, again, you can compute the invariance. It has infinite genus because uh, here, for instance, if, if I continue the drawing, uh, so there's a handle. And to each square, there is a handle. So there are infinitely many. It is uh, the space of ends is a point. If you take any, co any uh, compact uh, subset, uh, there is only one unbounded co connect complement in the, in the connected complement of the complement. And uh, the only n is non-planar. OK. So the invariants are the same. And so by the theorem, uh, those are actually homeomorphic. And then there is an exercise, which is uh, to find the explicit homeomorphism between the two, which is possible to do it, but it's uh, not at all obvious. And you can, you can even do a worse thing. Instead of taking this, you could take a, a three-dimensional analog of A, like a jungle gym. So, uh, so something in, in three space with, uh, with bars in, in three di duration that cross themselves. Again, you take the boundary of a thickening of this. This is, again, the surfaces. Again, it has the same invariant, so it must be homeo homeomorphic to the previous two. Good, so that's the, that was the main the theorem of uh, today's lecture. Now I'm going to, uh, to um, uh, do some remarks. Uh, first, I would like to present a more rigorous way of defining uh, open manifolds. Although I, will, I won't uh, make it very precise, but at least I will, I will indicate how it works. Okay. So uh, this manifold F1, for instance, how to, uh, to specify the manifold we, we, without having to, uh, to introduce uh, ellipses. Well, here's, here's one way to do it. So. So first, let me draw something on the, on the blackboard, and then I'll explain what, uh, what, what, uh, how you should uh, use it. So I claim that this diagram is a way to describe F1. So I'm going to explain how it works. So uh, here what you have is um, 
and the, well, probably there should, there should be an error here. So you, you take uh, finitely many uh, compact surfaces with boundary. Here, yeah, in this case, you have three. That's a disk. That's a pair of pens with one handle, and that's a, a cylinder. And then uh, you put some arrows um, between some of the boundary components. That's supposed to in, in indicate some glue-in glue uh, way of gluing those surfaces together. And uh, some of the arrows uh, go down in the, uh, some sort of hierarchy, and others are allowed to feed into uh, the same manifold again. Okay. So from this uh, set of data, so I'm not going to, to give a precise formal definition, but you can uh, look that up in a paper uh, I wrote uh, a few years ago, which is on, on the archive. Uh, from this, you, uh, you, uh, you, can, you can describe an open uh, surface. So what you do is the following. So you, you start with x, so you, you have the area that's, that says that you should start here. And so you put one copy of x. And then uh, you follow the arrows. So here, from x, in this case, there is just one arrow uh, going out. Uh, it goes to y. So I can produce a copy of y. So I, uh, I draw it. And then uh, I look at the arrows that go out of Y. In this case, there are two. There is one which feeds back into Y. That means that I have to introduce another copy of Y. And this one uh, goes to Z. So I produce the first copy of Z. and so on and so forth. So if, let me do it one stage further. So this, uh, here you should have another copy of, of y. Here you should have a copy of z. And here you should have, uh, once you are in z, then you have only one possibility. You have to loop back so you can, all you are going to do is put cylinders together. And then, uh, so that's, uh, that's a disconnected uh, um, manifold, and then you make it connected by gluing together all the pieces. And if you look at it carefully, then you would see that it's the manifold F1. Although it's, uh, well, it's not quite the same, same shape, but it's homomorphic to this. So you see you begin there. Here you have a first end uh, which is a cylindrical and then you have another one and then you have another one and you have the end infinity uh, which has infinite genus. So of course this is just one way of specifying F1. I could have more uh, other structures. So by the way this, this was what I call the topological uh, automaton. By, uh, by analogy with uh, finite state automata from uh, theoretical computer sciences, uh, th theoretical computer science. Difference be is that in, um, in computer science, finite state uh, automata, in general, you want them to stop in finite time. So you have uh, one or, or more entry points and you have uh, some, uh, some exits. But here you don't have exits and you, you, you need to, to have infinite loop. Th that's because you want to produce an open manifold. So it's, it, it's logical. And then just for, the, for fun, let me write down the, uh, the automaton that produces the manifold F2. So I have one which, uh, which, uh, which has uh, four states. So again, you start with a disk. Then the disk goes into a pair of pens. Then uh, the pair of pens, one exit feeds into itself. Another one goes to a third state. The third state is a pair of pens with one handle. 
which again fits into itself and and then another one goes to to uh, to a cylinder which loops and uh, so again there is an exercise which is not really uh, well defined so, uh, work out uh, other examples so for instance you can take your, your favorite uh, compact totally uh, dis disconnected space so supposing that you have one and then uh, you can try to, to see if you can produce it using an automaton uh, certainly well I, I should at least do the, can the counter uh, set so if you want to produce a surface which, uh, which has a, a counter set's worth of ends, then it's very simple. You just uh, do this. You just take a disk, a pair of pens. Maybe I should, I don't know, I have time. Yeah, I have some time. So I can, uh, I can explain uh, maybe this. This is going to, uh, to have a counter set as ends. And if you want, a simple automaton that, that will give uh, the set uh, the simplest set with just one accumulation point and isolated point uh, then okay so I have to remember if you want so you also yeah it's, it's, it's the same as F1 but without the handle so you, you can do it in three states in this, in this way And okay, let me just explain this uh, to see how it works. So the one interesting thing about this description is that um, you can describe the set of ends of the manifold just uh, by a purely a combinatorial way. The, and, and for this, you need to do the following. For every loop, uh, you put a letter. So in this case, let me put the letter A to this loop and uh, the letter B to, to that loop. And then, an end of the manifold uh, corresponds to an infinite word on the letters, in this case, A and B, which can be uh, produced by the automaton using the rules of the automaton. So what does that mean in, in this sense? So you start here, then you go there, and you have two choices. Either you can uh, say A and repeat, or you can go there and say B. So one at one extreme, uh, you can do you can do only A's, so that's a word so that, with, that has infinitely many A's. So let me write this A uh, infinity. But you can also ignore A and just do go B and do infinitely many B's. Or you could uh, do finitely many A's and then infinitely many B's. So for every uh, for every uh, integer k, you have uh, so for instance you have. A, a B infinity or A uh, to the K uh, finite B infinity. Okay. So then you have a, a, a language of infinite words and this uh, uh, is in bijection with the space of ends of the manifold. And the bijection is even a homeomorphism for the, if you put the right topology on this. Um, so, so okay, so A infinity corresponds to infinity and uh, the a, k, a to the KB infinity corresponds to the, to the integers in this case. And so once you understand this, uh, then you look at what happens for this automaton. Here you have b, A, here you have B. So in this case, you can do any word. So it's a free, uh, I don't know how it's called, free monoid, but uh, it's, not, uh, it's not the classical thing because you, it's about infinite words. So you can do any infinite words uh, with, the like, with the letters A and B, and uh, this gives counter set. Right, okay, so, qu a question? Yes? Are you just producing examples, or do you claim that any open surface is obtainable by such a procedure? Uh, that's, what, uh, what, that's a good question. So I don't... Uh, yeah, okay, I'm going to answer the question. So this only produces uh, countably many surfaces. And uh, it's an exercise that, uh, that there are uncountably, and I think you, you know how to do the exercise. 
that, uh, that there are uncountably many manifolds. So uh, most manifolds cannot be produced in this way. That's a good point. Okay, so now uh, let's forget a bit about, yeah? Can you uh, identify when two such constructions are the same? Yes, so uh, the, uh, at, I, I did this in, uh, in the paper. Uh, you can, I can give you the reference uh, if you want. So in particular, it means that there is an algorithm that tells when two uh, automaton give the same surface. And this uses the, cla the classification, but you have to make the classification effective. So, in some sense. Okay, so now I want to, uh, to go to Riemannian geometry. So, is there anything uh, interesting about Riemannian geometry that we can say about those surfaces? So, actually, I don't know the answer to this question. So uh, let's start with a naive question. Uh, so the question is the following. There are really two questions. Um, which uh, open surfaces admit a Riemannian metric? of, uh, so the first question is uh, positive curvature and uh, the, the next, the other question is negative curvature. So what do you, what do you think about, about it? So negative curvature, it's not too difficult to see that all of them do. You can, uh, you can construct this, uh, for instance, using decom pants decomposition or decomposition with cylinders, for instance. But uh, perhaps it's more surprising that for positive curvature, the, uh, the, it's the same. All, the, all those surfaces uh, have matrix of positive curvature. This is a theorem of Gromov. It's a special case of, of a theorem of Gromov. If you replace curvature by sectional curvature, it's true in all dimensions greater than one. And uh, I don't know the proof of this theorem. Yeah, I have absolutely no idea. Well, I have some idea, but I don't, uh, I've never seen the proof uh, of this. So here the point is that the metric, I'm not requiring the metric to be complete. So maybe a more, uh, Interesting question, I don't know is, uh, which manifold admit a complete metric of positive curvature and negative curvature? So negative curvature is still all manifolds, but here, a complete metric of positive curvature, then there's only one, it's just R2. Okay, so that's very restrictive. And, uh, okay, so, uh, this, uh, this is all uh, I'm going to say about the subject. So maybe a, f a few uh, final remarks. Um, yeah, okay, so I'm, I'm going to phrase this as an exercise. So that's exercise uh, six. So let F be an open surface. Uh, the first question, assume that the fundamental group of M is trivial. So F, uh, F is simply connected. And uh, show that uh, F is uh, homeomorphic to R2. So that's the Poincaré conjecture for open surfaces if you want. And it's not difficult. Once you know the, the classification, it's not difficult. You, you just have to use the Van Kampen theorem. 
And you can also try to do it without your, the, 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 the classification. Maybe it's, I, don't, I haven't tried to do it. And something uh, that also is going to, to be interesting for later, uh, classify such surfaces such that the fundamental group is abelian. So this is, this is a special case, but uh, it's also, uh, you will see that it's uh, very restrictive. So uh, this is the end of uh, chapter one. So I don't want to start uh, chapter two uh, now because I, I don't have time to go anywhere. So instead, well, maybe we have several possibilities. Either I can stop here and then you have some free time to either uh, think about the exercises or um, do something else. Or uh, we can uh, have an activity. <laughs> and the activity would be uh, try to find as many examples of three manifolds as possible. Because the next, the next uh, chapter will be about three manifolds. And so before giving you the, the theory, I would like you to, to think about producing as many examples of uh, three manifolds. So if you, you, we can, you can do it uh, se separately or we can do it here. Uh, what, what do you think? What is, uh, we, have, we have some time, we have 20 minutes. <laughs> no, uh, op open, close, whatever, even with boundary. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Okay, so here I put the, the closed ones, and here open. Let's say without boundary for for simplicity. Okay, all three. <laughs> what else? Yeah. Okay, the unit. I must repeat because the, it's. Um, it's, uh, I, I, I am filmed, uh, and so I have to repeat what you said because uh, yeah. maybe. Uh, so you said the unit tangent bundle of a surface. So of course, if the surface is closed, this will be a closed, and if it's open, this will be open. So it's in both ca category. So okay, the T1 of F uh, G F G closed. Okay. So that's a way to produce three manifolds from two manifolds. That's a good intro. That's a good way. Okay. Other suggestions? Yeah. A not complement. A not uh, Where? In any manifold, of course. But that would be okay. So let's let's say a not complement in uh, S three. So, um, yeah, I suppose uh, it will never be closed. So depending on what you, whether you take the, the, the complement or the complement of an open neighborhood, it would be with a manifold, compact manifold with boundary or uh, open. So here it fits uh, here. So S3 minus the nuts. If you really take this, of course, it's an open manifold. Okay, the product of a surface and R. Uh, okay, R. I was thinking about something else, of course. No. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to call it sigma. Uh, mapping torus of raw well, case. Okay. So I suppose the classical case uh, is uh, closed. So uh, assuming I have a surface of genus G, a mapping class, uh, and then you can take the mapping torus. But of course, you could produce open manifolds with our mapping tori. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you start with open surfaces. So this is something, I don't know if it has been studied at all. But so well, th those are examples, of course. 
Yeah. Yeah. So again, ciphered manifold, the classical case, uh, there are compact, but uh, you can make the same definition and take non-compact ones. And again, this is something which apparently hasn't been studied by, by anyone, but uh, it could be interesting. Uh, maybe we can stop here and then we can think about other, other examples <laughs> by yourself. Okay. Any open subset? Any open, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's right. Any open subset of a manifold is a manifold of the same di dimension. Uh, oh, yes, I suppose S3 is, uh, is not open. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you for your attention.